So good evening and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Constance McIntosh. I'm the Acting Scholarly Director at the McEachan Institute for Public Policy and Governance at Dalhousie. And the McEachan Institute is based at Dalhousie University, which is located in Shibuktuk, Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral, unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, where sharing takes place pursuant to the Peace and Friendship Treaties. And these lands are also ones where African Nova Scotians were settled through enslavement, through fleeing enslavement elsewhere, or relocating through various migrations or in response to promises that governments made. African Nova Scotians are founding peoples who formed distinct communities over 400 years ago with distinct cultures, traditions, social and political practices that have and continue to contribute to shaping the story of this province and its future. Today's event forms a part of that story and ensuring that African Nova Scotian knowledge is respected and is told and is heard. I'm honored to have played a supporting role in this group coming together for an African Nova Scotian community calling in agency accountability, representation and self-determination. And I'm now gonna introduce you to the panel chair and event co-organizer, Sylvia Paris Drummond, and then I'm gonna step back. Um, Sylvia is the president of uh, CV Paris Consulting. She's the CEO of the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute. And her work is rooted in core Afrocentric principles. Much of her work is focused on anti-racism and social equity transformation. And she is an entrepreneur, a seasoned collaborator, and a social justice change agent. Um, she's received the RBC Social Change Award. And through her extensive public sector involvement, Sylvia has a deep understanding and appreciation for what it takes to conduct policy analysis and move that analysis to implementation. So Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, Constance. Um, I, I need to say that folks in, in the beginning here all, we were talking a bit about the level of, of, uh, of uh, energy um, that we're hoping that can come through in terms of our dialogue here together. And I'm hoping that the folks who are, are joining this in all, from various audiences are, are able to feel that as well. So thanks, Constant, to your team for your support work for this evening um, and staying in the conversation that we had that, that's helped to bring us here. I want to reference uh, this morning, I heard Robert uh, Wright's interview on CBC Information Morning, um, and it reminded me that this conversation about the bigger issues that we're going to delve into uh, in discussion time here together, um, that these are fed by ongoing scenarios of snippets of things that have happened, that have happened in the media, that have happened um, uh, amongst dialogue sharing in terms of community. That this conversation started, so this round of conversation, because also we'll talk about historically some of these things have been repetitive for us, that this round of conversation started about six months ago. And so we've been discussing and discussing and getting ourselves here. So it's been wonderful journeying with the McCaffrey Institute and inspiring communities. And shout out to Louise Adalgo for being one of the igniters in this conversation and to the panel who will be fully introduced soon uh, for being igniters and setting in the fire of, the, of this work um, and these flames of brilliance. The path to tonight's dialogue, while not linear, was always purpose-filled and intentional, as is our title, an African Nova Scotian community calling in agency, accountability, representation, and self-determination. Uh, appreciative of the acknowledgement of the intersection of, of our longevity here as Black community, African Nova Scotian community, uh, and the contributions in the, um, and the relationship between um, Mi'kmaq lands and, and the peoples and Mi'kmaq peoples who steward, and that, steward them. Um, and it's that longevity and that experience that we uh, have had that also is part of the foundational conversation about um, the dialogue of us as a distinct people here. Um, I want to share a proverb. Until the line learns how to write, 
Every story will glorify the hunter. This is a proverb from a country um, in the African continent um, that for me has multiple vantage points. Story, storytelling, and storying is our way of centering our voices. It is how we learn deeply um, and intently. It is how we pass on traditions. Our story and our experiences need to be truly validated and our voices heard. There was enlivened discussion with strong leadership from the Black family meetings that for some of us landed with a huge thud in government boardrooms. What is in our DNA memory, long ago history and contemporary history? We will spend our time together uh, tapping into the life experiences and knowledge from the panelists that will help inform. Our conversations are concerning the systemic issues which our community must continually reverberate against. The looming question, how to transform the relationship between the African Nova Scotian community and government into which better recognizes and serves the community without unduly burdening the community. In the books, So You Want to Talk About Race and Subtle Acts of Exclusion, authors Ifima Olu and Tiffany Jana and Michael Baran focus on voice and frame frameworks to support those who want to address systemic racism and discrimination. We are pleased with the level of engagement for this discussion has shown and evidenced in attendance, individuals reaching out to the panelists and media interest and coverage to inspire, it inspires us for the hope of opening ourselves to believe that there is a readiness to address the way race shapes society and the need to dismantle the systems that perpetuate the injustices. This is an initial conversation and we are considering how best to follow up. To that end, we have a Mentimeter page open for people to submit their ideas, comments and reflections during the session. You can access the Mentimeter page by clicking on the link in the chat. The panel will explore questions such as what would accountable provincial government look like for African Nova Scotian communities and how is our voice appropriately situated? So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the panelists for this evening. Their full, more fulsome bio um, is available via the McCarthy um, Institute website. So I'm going to begin with Carol Ann Wright. Carol Ann Wright is a director of capacity building and strategic initiatives in African Nova Scotian communities at the Halifax Partnership. She is also the Social Justice Action Chair at the African United Baptist Association. Caroline has worked in community and community economic development for over 40 years in locations including Toronto, South Africa, Ghana, and Nova Scotia. Robert Seymour Wright is a social worker and sociologist whose 31 year career has spanned the fields of education, child welfare, forensic mental health, trauma, sexual violence, and cultural competence. As a clinician slash academic slash administrator, he has integrated his work developing direct practice clinical service to clients with teaching and supervising interns and promoting lasting systemic change through social policy advocating. Dr. Barb Hamilton Hinch is from the historical African Nova Scotian communities of Beachville and Cherry Brook. She is currently the Associate Vice President of Equity and Inclusion and Associate Professor in the School of Health and Human Performance at Dalhousie University. Her work examines the impact of structural, systemic, and institutional racism 
on diverse populations, particularly people of African descent. Dr. Lynn Jones. Lynn is a proud African, African Canadian born and raised in Truro, Nova Scotia. Her Nova Scotia roots span several generations, making her one of several indigenous African Nova Scotians residing here for over 40 years. Being employed as a federal public, 400 years, pardon me, <laughs> for being employed as a federal public service employee for over 30 years, coupled with her extensive experience in the Canadian labor movement has enabled Lynn to be a social justice leader in areas many Black people have never ventured before. Welcome to all of our panelists, and thank you again for sharing your time, experiences, skills, talents, and advice. So we are going to open the dialogue. And the way that we're, we're hoping this evening will be able to flow is I'm going to pose a question, um, and one right now that each of the panelists will answer. Um, and then we'll come back around through a few other questions. The panelists are encouraged to have conversations uh, with each other. So if you hear something that speaks to you and you want to amplify that or speak to it, um, or if you want to challenge it, we invite those conversations in this type of dialogue that we'll have um, this evening. So thank you. So I'm going to pose my first question to, um, to Lynn. Um, and I'll acknowledge to everyone if we'll just go around now on a first name basis um, after our post our introduction of bios we just had. So uh, what for you, what for you brings you into this conversation? First of all, um, thank you to the McCachran Institute for hosting this panel. It's really unique. And uh, I think we'll all agree it's very exciting. Um, and thank you, uh, Sylvia, for the introduction and for guiding us through this uh, really uh, different process with different types of questions. So in, in response to, I had to think about what really brings me to this discussion this e uh, evening. And I thought, you know what? It's not hard for me to say. What brings me here is love. And with that love, it's because I have this love that surpasses all understanding for my people and um, for the liberation of my people. So being here in this space is part of that liberation uh, journey. But not only do I love my people, it may seem, seem strange when we're gonna be talking about all the things that our governments are doing for us, that I love my country. I love Canada and, and, and I, I love my province and, and my little town. <laughs> and do, do we need some changes? Most definitely. But what drives me is my love for wanting things to be better and be the best that it can possibly uh, be. Having said that, what also brings me here is thinking about the journey of those that came before me, my ancestors. And one of my favorite, of course, is Harriet Tubman. I, I can't say her name a lot enough and how I encouraged by what she did to try to affect changes. And with governments, because we don't, uh, we don't hear about all the, uh, all the attributes that she had in, uh, in uh, attempting to free our people from their, their enslavement. So that's good. Um, so it's this, this love that, uh, to tell you the truth, and as Sylvia told me we could be honest and open this evening, and I intend to be that. I didn't want to come. <laughs> Again, given all that, this love, I didn't want to come because I know that sometimes people think that as African people that we all think the same, we all do the same thing, and we all agree on everything, and it's not the case. And when you're sometimes not I, I kind of would classify what happens with government. Governments like the margins. So I really don't get to be close often with government because not being part of what I consider the margins um, um, 
or, or the mainstream rather, that I actually end up on the margins. So not being part of the mainstream. So this whole thing about the, from the margins to the mainstream, but do we really want to be in the mainstream? So I'll leave it there because I can already talk on forever and ever um, about government and where I find myself placed uh, within it. But uh, for sure, um, a lot of the times the, the goal is to be at the mainstream, but do we really want to be there? It's my question. I'm posing a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. And, 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 and thank you for holding up if we can have things that are, for example, about a collective, right? Maybe of doing, but not necessarily monolithic or all in the same. We could have a shared direction. So yeah, so for thank you for raising that up. And thank you for starting with love in such an invitational way. Very much appreciative of that. Um, Robert, would you like me to repeat the question for you as well? What brings you into this conversation? Well, I think uh, I, uh... A number of things in my past, I suppose, bring me here. Uh, I'm from Halifax. I'm a Haligonian, an African Nova Scotian. I, and like Lynn, I have a tremendous love for this place. Um, it's funny, I've studied away um, a number of times. And every time I've studied away, uh, the people I've studied with were, were trying to keep me. I say, no, I'm a Scotian. I'm going home. You know, uh, and I think that what brings me to this conversation is a recognition that African Nova Scotians are here and we're not going anywhere. And the reality is, I always say that racism is North America's original sin. And so our people have been impacted by that. And we must constantly be in the conversation of making things better, not just for people of African descent, because the kind of toxicity that is bred by racism really infects everybody. And so our emancipation as a, an African people here in Nova Scotia really um, supports uh, social justice and equity for everyone. And so I think that that's what brings me to the conversation. Thank you, thank you for that. And I'm glad no one could persuade you to stay away. It would have been a loss not to have you here at the table where you, you know, you, you've been and bring such a, Good conversation and good insight. So thank you for that. So and, and you know, and thinking about someone who's been away, as we heard a bit in the bio, um, Carol Ann, for you, can you um, answer for us um, the same question? What brings you in, into this conversation? I'm going to turn my mic. Really, I'm, I'm not sure if you're hearing us. We are not not hearing you. So i um, not sure if you want to throw in the chat to see if you are hearing us. And we can certainly come back around to you if you'd like to uh, reboot or. Yeah, back to me. I'm trying to get on at least um, my voice on. I'm trying. OK, um, so we'll so we will come back to you on that. that. So you can go, go ahead. Yep, thanks. We'll come back to you with that with that question. Um, so, um, so we're going to go to to Barb um, with the with the uh, the same question as well, Barb. So, for you, what? Yeah, what brings you into this conversation? Well, I think it's it's quite interesting that all three of us has mentioned love as part of that, and and I also acknowledge the ancestors whose shoulders I stand on. And I always say that my accomplishments and what I do, I don't do by myself. So I'm lifted by community. I'm lifted by people of African descent. So I also feel I have that strong sense of responsibility that if we become and do better, then we want to reach back and make sure that others are also moving with us. And that's important for me. So as an eighth generation African Nova Scotian and having been um, both witnessed, experienced, and been a part of some of the racist and oppressive and discriminatory experiences within Nova Scotia, within Canada, um, as an educator and researcher and a community activist and member of the community, I have a responsibility to be here, um, to engage in this conversation, to see what difference we can make. 
and how we can make things better for all people of African descent, but particularly for African Nova Scotians. Um, like Robert, I identify as that proud African Nova Scotian from one of our 52 historical African Nova Scotian communities, but also recognize the, the oppression discrimination of many people. And, and so therefore this conversation is important um, to set direction of what can we do better? What can we do, do, do next? And how can we better support each other on this journey? Thank you, Barb, for that. And, and yeah, and, and thanks for kind of echoing out, you know, what seems to be, I use the term DNA around some things of DNA in us in terms of what might be a, known as part of that resilience, like love, loving self, loving community, and, and being open in terms of, uh, of that um, re relational way, maybe I'll, I'll say it in, in terms of that. Um, we, we want to go and talk a bit about historical context. Um, and so we'll be able, you know, kind of build from some things that have said already. Do you want to check back in with Carol Ann um, for the opportunity to, uh, to respond to this question as well? And let's just see, let's send everything out to the universe to let the tech cooperate with us. How are we doing? Carolyn, are we able to invite you back into the conversation? So as we said, we the panelists will be able to, you know, themselves to come in and to attach the conversation. So um, I'll, I'll let Caroline, I'll say it out loud so Caroline can hear that again. When you, you know, hop right in when it works for you to hop in and we'll continue. But uh, I, I do want to kind of, um, queue up that I, I wanted to um, have you maybe start this conversation where we wanted to talk a bit about historical context um, and collective response um, and acknowledging that the collective, um, like what does that mean and how do we gauge in that way? And one of the things that I wanna highlight that is in your fuller bio is all the juggling, all that you've taken on where you work in your workspace uh, to contribute to your skills, the places that you have volunteered and set up, Imhotep plans, co-chair faculty, health, health and diversity inclusion. So it almost feels like saying, besides your day job, you got all this other work going on. So, so, um, so in terms of knowing that that is is in your reality and your passion, maybe, um, can you say a little bit about? what for you is the historical context here uh, of talking about our community um, and collective response as well. Well, and, and saying some of those things that you just um, mentioned, Sylvia, I think it, I often think about how long we've been here as a, as a people, as people of African descent in Nova Scotia. So over 400 years. And because we're also talking about our interaction with the, the province and with the country, um, the government was founded in 1867. And I just Googled that to find out how long was the government you know, established versus how long were we here as people of African descent. And so in saying that, that's 155 years difference. And then we also think about, um, and, and the other context that's important to me is, is people don't realize that people of African descent we're also colonized. And that's important to talk about our history as colonized people, that we also lost language and culture, that we were, there were segregated schools that existed here. Um, in a talk last night, one of our colleagues, Vanessa Fells, talked about sundown laws that existed. So although people like to think that we didn't have Jim Crow laws that existed in Nova Scotia, that we didn't have um, slavery in, in Nova Scotia, I'm very excited that other research is informing people otherwise. But yet, despite that history, we are not part of the fabric of the government in the ways that we need to be part of the fabric of the government. And so as you listed, a lot of my research looks at both education, at health, um, also a little bit in injustice. When I think about those systems that have not worked to support people of African descent and more specifically African Nova Scotians, that is one of, one of my responsibilities in terms of the context of we have been left out and not include it in so many of the decisions that have been made that affect us directly as people of African descent. And so when you think about that gap of 155 years and, and having being on this panel with, with all of my colleagues, you have that expertise that exists in our, in our communities that could inform, that could educate, that could be part of informing government. Yet many of us are not asked to sit at that table in the way that we should be sitting at that table. 
And, and I guess so for me, those are some of the reasons, the context as to why I continue to do, to do what I do is because there's been so many opportunities that haven't been afforded to people of African descent. And as I think um, it was opened up as we're one of the founding peoples and people tend to forget that African Nova Scotians are one of the founding cultures of this province. And therefore we have a right to be actively engaged in all aspects of, of Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you. And thank you for raising up, you know, this comparison about government, the structure that came at this particular time and how long we've been here. And uh, Lynn, I, I wanna give you a heads up that I'm gonna be coming to you to talk about this idea about what does government do and what do communities do? Because I know we, you know, we've th there's there's a phrase um, that you kind of have said with us: uh, governments do what governments do. <laughs> and so maybe you want to talk a little bit about that and about community. And then Robert, I think we'll bounce over to you after. Uh, I feel like some of the stuff has been lined up here from some of what you talked about this morning um, for folks were able to hear that interview with CBC and then others as well. So I'm gonna stop and let Lynn and Robert in. Sorry, you always gotta find that mute. You keep it off in between and then, but remember to put it back on again, <laughs> technology. Yeah, I, I, I still think it's interesting that you uh, pick up that, pick up on that because it's one of my, my favorite lines, governments do uh, what governments uh, are supposed to do. And um, I think what the problem is as a community is that we don't really recognize that um, that's how it unfolds. It doesn't mean to say what governments do is right or we shouldn't challenge it. But I think that more importantly, it's communities need to do what communities do and organize and 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 form the, the united fronts, uh, for lack of a better word, um, within the communities. And what comes to mind, and I'm no, I know um, uh, Robert so succinctly raised it on uh, the morning uh, show uh, this morning, information uh, uh, morning. I think um, with with how communities um, operate, we often um, are, are reactive in sometimes in our responses. So government comes out, um, they make appointments, then they rescind, <laughs> the next government rescinds that same appointment. So communities then gets up in arms because they rescinded something that they actually ended up appointing to begin with. And we forget that the community didn't uh, have any say in this either government. And to go back to community and say, well, but as a community, who do we want to appoint within our communities or within government? We, we lose that discussion. And all of a sudden we're moved over to what government is doing and responding uh, to government. And I always just shake my head and say, you know, that's what governments do. Okay, what are we gonna be doing? What do we wanna do? And um, how do we wanna build within our, forget what they're doing. Like, let's just get going and do, which is also part of this whole concept of distinct uh, people and distinct society. What, who are we as distinct people and what do we want as distinct people? And how are we going to get um, what it is that we're trying to achieve as um, as distinct people? So I don't know if that's all understandable, but it is to me. <laughs> and in terms of how I organize within uh, uh, communities, um, I go back to my original um, opening. Um, I had. A, I was at a meeting, it's not even less than a month ago. And uh, I invited people that were doing a lot of community work over many years. And in that meeting, they were at the table with uh, some government uh, people. And I was, I guess I shouldn't have been shocked, but they came back and said, wow, Lynn, I, I've never been at a meeting like that before. 
Um, this is a high, we call it a high table. This is the high table. We're here with government sitting at the same table. These are people that have been organizing in our communities for over 30 years, grassroots organizing, and yet we're not, we're not invited or had never been at what they now consider this high table. Um, there's something wrong with that picture. The people that are doing the groundwork, um, organizing and volunteering in our communities are not at those tables with government or at decision um, making tables. Why is that? Does that have to do something to do with even our communities and how we're organizing um, as distinct uh, communities? I don't know, I throw that out. I can throw all kinds of things out tonight. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. We're gonna, we're, Robert, we're gonna transition over to you, but I, I, I did want to say just quickly, I just took a glance and I see some, there's some questions that are being put in the chat. So I wanted to say to folks, the question, there's a Q and A function in the, should be the lower part of your screen, which is where the, where we would ask you to put the questions um, for a number of reasons. But the main one being is that that's where we're gonna go check for the questions. And I think in the whole flow of chat, it could be, get lost and I don't want those questions to get lost. So I just noticed that there now when I was, uh, looking. So just to, to say that for folks that they uh, put you, the questions in the Q&A area it would be great. Um, and so the, Lynn gave us a lot of great stuff, which I won't kind of expound on or question back to. Robert, I'm just going to keep flowing right over to you, please. For sure. Uh, I'd, I'd prefer though to to uh, to defer to Carol Ann if she wanted to to chime in before I before I I respond to some of the things that have been said. And if not, I can, I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I've had trouble getting in, so um, I'm going to, I don't even know what the question, I was listening to Lynn as I came in. So those were, um, you know, really important points that Lynn was making about community. Um, the thing I want to answer the first question in terms of how I come to this work, because that for me is what is the foundation of this is why I'm still in it, why I still love it. And people mention the word love, and that is really important in this work. It's not the euphoric love. Um, you know, what you see when you see your friends, you hug them. It's not about that. This is a love that endures even when community gets on your nerves. I'm, I'm going to be straight up and honest. That's the kind of love that you have for this work. And when you disagree with folks, it's still in love. Um, and I do really feel that sense of um, necessity in terms of love our community and do what is necessary. I also an amateur historian in that following the work of the collective works on the community. And as much as there's individuals that you know lead this work, I'm in love with the collective. And when you read our history, um, going back beyond before the AUBA in 1854, you see the African, um, the African society and the African abolitionist society and all those things which we come from, which all our work and our organizations are built on, you see the same things that they were talking about. They came as a collective, they understood who they were in context um, as part of that collective. And that's why I stay in this work because um, as, as it's, um, Harvey Money Whistle writes really well about this. He, he's a phenomenal historian and I read all of his works and Blacks on the Border is one of my favorite uh, pe uh, works that he has, has written. And you can see us in all this work and how we move forward. And as you go through the trajectory of what we have done, we are continuing to build on that. So when we get frustrated is that we're going backwards, we actually are, it is a continuation of that work from the 1800s on. When we landed, we began to organize. We understood our collectivity. So I just wanted, that, that's my foundation in terms of why this work is important because I believe we are it. Like Lynn, I believe we are the experts. And like Robert said, we are the experts in terms of our, our present and our future because we understood our past. We understand that we have a black print that has shown us how to do this work. All as a founding people, once we understand it, that's all we have to do is follow it. So I will stop there. 
Yeah, I love that, a black print. <laughs> I guess I would, I would say that thinking about that, this, when we think about government, we think about community, we think about the formal structures in the province, and we think about the black community. I think that one of the things that, that I think about is that government's only job is to hold together our collective infrastructure so that as a people in our communities, we can thrive. Is there anything else that government is supposed to do other than to hold together that infrastructure so that we can thrive? And if that's if a simple way of thinking about the relationship between community and government, then you've got to think about all the ways in which government has almost seemingly had an active campaign of destruction against communities that have mm -hmm. not been allowed to evolve their destiny. You know, uh, Africville wiped off the map, just not permitted to evolve. You know, you know when we think about uh, um, uh, the kind of major infrastructure things that happen, look at housing, for example, and the way the the way mm -hmm. we uh, the way we zone land and approve development and that sort of thing uh, yeah. destroys community. We have food deserts, so that yeah. there are communities where there's not not a grocery store you can walk to, um, and we have allowed grocery stores to become warehouse stores that only middle class people with vehicles can get to. Uh, in Bears Lake or, 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 or Dartmouth Crossing um, so that the poor folk living in communities are no longer thriving, right? Not, not able to engage. So I think that there is a sense in which African Nova Scotians must inform government and even require government to act in a way that does not compromise communities' capacity to exist and thrive. And uh, uh, that I think is the bottom line for me. Um, and it seems, unfortunately, certainly when I look at, at a housing as an issue, for example, we, we, we have a housing crisis in a province where, where every single crane in the, in the province is operational. Right, <laughs> building tall, in, tall buildings and with more condos and apartments and so forth. How is that supporting community? And how is that specifically serving black community, African Nova Scotian community? It is not. So the city and the province in allowing those things to happen is interfering with our capacity to evolve our destiny robbing from us the resources that belong to our, us as a people, to belong to all of us as a people. So that's the kind of thing that I think about when I think about this intersection of, uh, of community and government. Can I just add something silly? When Robert, when you're talking about the different stuff in the community, what comes to my mind as well is our education institutions and our health centers, right? So similar to grocery stores. And I used to take some of our students on journeys to see where is the closest hospital for some of our black communities? Where is the closest school for some of our black communities? Talking about transportation into higher education for some of our black communities. And what happens when people have to move from their community to access resources? And so your point, I, I just love the point that you made about how these lack of resources are destroying our community. And when we talk about the fact that education is a way for emancipation, education is a way for power, yet there's such restriction and access to education, especially higher education, based on where our communities are located and the limitations that we put in place to be able to access that. So thank you for those points. Carolyn. I wanted, uh, Robert triggered um, another point around the infrastructure of African Nova Scotian communities and black spaces, um, which is a really important thing that we need to begin to talk about more. I talk about it more because that's the, job, the work I do. 
for example, if we were to look at the infrastructure and rebuilding of black communities that either have been um, destroyed or, or raised or people left and, and were deserted, to reconstruct our communities in a way to level the equal playing field begins at $250 billion, looking at water, all those things that would take to build a community. If you compared it to uh, Bedford, some of those communities, Eastern Shore, um, other fishing villages, if you actually dollar for dollar, the beginning price to reconstruct black communities, to reimagine um, the way that we want to live, that equality around uh, shopping, gardening, education and housing, all those things put together, it would begin at 250 billion. That is an accurate, that's a number, right? And I'm only saying that because we forget about this in the context of after we celebrated Emancipation uh, Day. And in the States after emancipation, we are aware, uh, we are aware of the fact that there were, um, was reconstruction. And reconstruction for better or for worse, allowed the African-American community to begin to put dollars to deficit, begin to put dollars to rebuilding a black infrastructure for folks who were enslaved and had nothing after emancipation. At least, and even it went sideways and people began to burn down cities because they saw black folks starting to get a leg up. We didn't even have that conversation in Canada after emancipation. There was no thought of the deficit of our communities and our education because we had uh, we had segregation in the education system, the separate, the separate, separate school act. We had that. No one talks about the fact that what was the deficit there and how, um, and, and we worked on it and there's a lot of advances in education, but that period of time, there was no resources put to that, uh, to, to more to Robert's point. So what does reconstruction look like now? What are the dollars? And I'm with the panelists on terms of what is the government's role in that? To recognize the plan that the community has developed not to develop the plan for community, but recognize uh, the plan that the community developed and put resources to that plan, a holistic plan, not the piecemeal stuff that is happening now. And that's more about, you know, a black conversation, but nevertheless, I just wanted to make sure I got that point in tonight. Well, I, th I think that's easy for me to piggyback um, both of these I'm points. Sure. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's easy for me to piggyback both of these points because, of course, when you're talking about um, uh, the ability to recreate communities and build communities, and we're talking about billions of dollars just to do that, then mm -hmm. immediately what comes to mind for me is the whole concept of re reparations. So this is not mm -hmm. a new phenomenon. Um, it's happened since the, the, the beginning, not before the transatlantic slave trade, and it's followed us, of course, all the way over here to Canada. Yet, um, as we work through all the things that we're talking about, um, through no fault of our own, through the racism, history, colonialism, all those terms that we used, use that our communities are in this situation, and yet, the demand of repar for reparations is not a widespread concept, not only um, from government, because we should be totally ashamed of our government, our Canadian government, in not signing on to recognize um, slavery as a crime against humanity and the need for reparations for all these erasures that we're talking about in our community. Not only is the Canadian government not, in fact, they actually willfully um, um, politicked uh, against uh, the idea of reparations, um, as neither has our provincial government or our municipal governments um, signed on. I mean, we had the uh, United Nation, Nation experts, whatever title it was that they, that they used, who did a, came to, to Halifax, Nova Scotia and did a full report on what was happening, these things that were raising and said reparations, the, the government needs to consider reparations for all these things. And um, that, it's hard to believe how long ago that was. And we've moved absolutely nowhere in terms of even with the United Nations coming in to talk about that. So thank you, Caroline too, for uh, 
um, talking about the, uh, this erasure, I, I'd like to also bring it down to uh, even a, a more, a simpler, more visible level. And I look at my communities as I'm moving around, even in the, my small town of, of Troll and the community that um, the black area that I live known as the Marsh. And I grew up basically majority uh, black area of the town. There is now two and a half families left. Two and a half. And I'm the half. <laughs> 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 within that, um, with that, in that community. Yet, there's no oak cry. Where's the oak cry? Like the, the, the local community doesn't have this thing we're talking about, the resources, or they don't maybe feel that they have, quotes unquote, the, the formal educational level to fight government around uh, this issue. Um, we're not doing it generally. Um, it, it's not written anywhere, but yet my community's gone, basically gone. So, so I just leave that open, but it's happening all over the place in all these little communities. So I'm going to insert myself, David, uh, Robert, just before you, you speak. Um, and I'm going to call this a bit of a, a rapid round piece. I'll let you speak first to it because maybe it will be, you can make the connection. But, you know, you, we, so as I said, this conversation started months ago. It started around what was happening with government uh, to us, <laughs> whatever, right? Where our voice was, where, where was our agency? And then, you know, we had, we have the, the, the black family meetings, we came together, we had advice, we were taking our kind of leadership position. Then we got in this scenario cycle of things again that seemed to be happening. So in part of our entitling, there's two, there's, there's, there's two of the four words that are there in that list that I want us to kind of speak to a little bit here before we start the transition into inviting questions from the audience. So I, I want to hear a bit from you all about accountability and about self-determination. Yeah. And self-determination cross-connecting with accountability in terms of, uh, of our community, of ourselves. Lynn teased us a little bit about, well, what are we doing for ourselves in terms of our leadership, in terms of community? Accountability, we might imagine in terms of, as Robert has said, in terms of well, what the government role is. So what in terms of government? So. So yeah, so kind of in a rapid round way so we can hear the voices. Can you talk to us a little bit about those words? And Robert, I will invite you in to begin. Yeah, well, that's where, where I was going actually, because I was saying to myself, let's imagine for a moment that uh, the United Nations uh, says, okay, we're going to acknowledge the harm done to people of African descent in Canada, uh, press the Canadian government make, to make reparations, that that was a movement that went around the globe. And then uh, the Canadian government, the federal government came to, to African Nova Scotians and said, okay, it's time to work out a reparations deal. Okay. By what mechanism do African Nova Scotians organize to be in that conversation? Right? And this, is, this goes to the question of self-determination and governance among our people. And uh, I think that that's a really great segue to the Black family meeting process and other processes that might exist in the Black community to advance uh, our capacity around governance. And I don't know if, if Carol Ann is ready to talk about that, but she has certainly taken some leadership in this uh, Black family meeting as a um, as one of the vehicles that we have for building consensus and, and finding direction. I don't know, Caroline, if you wanted to talk about that. Yes. Um, can you hear me? I have to ask. That yes, yes, <laughs> we can hear you. So I think that's one of the most, um, because it's also, you know, historic and historic trend in terms of building consensus and community, I think it's really important that we continue to work on that. Um, you know, I was so um, overwhelmed when the call came out, when the issue with government first came in, those decisions were made around 
um, appointments and firings and the community was, uh, you know, just devastated by that. And people decided to get on a call and to be virtual and to have 300 people or over on that call for me was quite incredible. It showed a couple of things. Yeah, people wanted to have a conversation, but we were willing to have a difficult conversations as well. So to build that consensus and to begin to have the conversation about, um, as you say, what does self-determination look like and have um, this process respected by community. And that's what was my concern. My concern is that community going to support, are we going to support each other in this particular issue on what we we're saying and how to move forward? And I think the community I have to give full kudos did that very well. Was it full agreement? Not necessarily, but th but that was also um, echoed on the call as well, those who were, who, who were not um, you know, in agreement. But I think it provides a really strong passageway and foundational work to what capacity building looks like, what it looks like to have a collective response. Again, because it's not new to us, there have been Black family meetings called on several issues throughout our history and have been very important in, in the development of the Human Rights Commission, the development of BUF and a number of other issues. This has been the process that the community has taken. So we need we have a, a core, um, as you say, it's not the only thing, but it's one of those ways to, to, to develop the collective response to whether it be reparations or on a specific issue. And we have those really strong things to build on. Thanks to both of you. Uh, Barb Lynn, who would like to go first? I'll just, I'll jump in and, and um, one thing when, when you said the whole self-determination and accountability and what was going through my head, even as listening to Carol Ann and Robert speak is that collective voice. And what upsets me is when that voice isn't heard because we have put a lot of time into our black community meetings. And I feel so empowered when I'm with collectively with our black community meetings. And so when our black family meetings, and, and as, as Carol was saying, I was like saying the verse, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And when we're in those spaces, it's that sense of power, that sense of sharing each other's pain and trauma and anger and emotions and all that that comes with it. And I think that we have proven in some areas around our accountability and self-determination. When I think about the work that has gone on around the COVID clinics, for instance, as black people, we advocated for that service in our black communities under the direction and leadership of ABSW and, and Hawk. And then the Black family means even the work that DPAD is doing. And I think that we need to recognize some of these longstanding Black organizations, including BEA, which is one of our longest standing Black organizations, and the reason why that was founded. So I think in many cases, we have already shown that we can be accountable, that we are self-determined. And if we weren't that, then we wouldn't continue to have things like Saturday school. We wouldn't continue to be doing things like what's being developed under our Justice Institute through DPAD. And I think that all these are saying, we recognize some of our problems in our black community. We are not always gonna sit and wait for government. There's gonna be things we do and hope that we get support, but we're not gonna do it in spite of. And that speaks to self-determination, that speaks to accountability, and that speaks to responsibility to each other in our Black community. And that's one thing I love about being Black. No matter which community you go into, if you're lost, angry, hungry, knock on a door. And that still exists in all 52 of our Black communities. And that's something we have not lost. And, and that's something I'm very proud of. And when we want to reach out and support other communities, we extend that. When there's things going on in Truro, when there's things going on in Cape Breton, we try our best to connect and see if there's something that we need to do. Yes, we recognize that going online has restricted us, but seeing the, the outpour of passion and, and dedication during the Black family meetings say it is still possible for us to organize. It is still possible for us to make sure that we're being accountable for our own actions, as well as making government accountable to their actions. And so that to me is what that is. Well, Lynn, Barb got a lot of amens. She got people in church. You got to come strong on this one. Yourself. <laughs> well, you know what? As I'm listening to the conversation, it's like, Lynn, you better not go into this one too deep. You better just kind of uh, let it go because every time my opinions end up on a different vein, I'm like, okay, here we go again. And it's this whole, the whole concept of um, proactive and reactive. I, I, I guess I have a problem because 
so often governments have come into our community and um, made decisions for and on behalf of our communities, whether it's been supporting organization, deciding where funding's going um, in the community, um, deciding who's gonna be appointed to government. Governments do that. Community's not doing that. It's governments. And therefore I have a problem in terms of, even if we're talking from a, which a black family meeting perspective, of course there's a role for black family meetings who could dare to dispute that. But it's the subject matter of those meetings that I have difficulty with because I personally am not interested in what the government um, agenda is. I'm interested in the community agenda developing um, apart from whatever government's doing and how we're going to move that forward as opposed to reacting to something that the government does. So I'm leaving that alone and going somewhere else. And where I'm going <laughs> is um, I see in the chat, our dear sister Bernadette Hamilton reads on that chat. She's everywhere. I don't know how she does it, but she's, there's not an event that she's not at or and has something to say. So she's asked the question about gentrification and how we deal with um, gentrification of our communities. And that's a really good question because we really, really um, need to come up with a gentrification strategy uh, for our communities. And I just like to share that I personally um, am hotly involved right as we speak with initiatives around community land trust. And I invite people to Google because I couldn't sit here. And of course, Caroline is well aware of that working in her field, but um, rather than get into what they are, just Google and you'll get something there, go see Caroline. Um, but uh, I uh, very quickly, I, I had heard about them a long time ago and just recently am back into because Truro is really bothering me, the fact that that community is almost all but gone. And fortunately being able to amass uh, some land in that community that I wouldn't give up to developers despite them at my doorstep. And um, I'm uh, presently trying to turn that land back to the community. So it's community controlled, developed, and um, that we can stop at least on that in that area, the gentrification of this community. So I throw that out there because I think for all, housing is a major issue. Robert told us that. And if Robert says it, it's true. And so therefore housing is a problem and affordable housing is a problem. And one thing that those 400 years that other black communities haven't, don't have the advantage of we still have land in our communities and we're losing it at a phenomenal rate. So I invite people to find ways to stop this gentrification and look at how, how we are going to develop even housing and infrastructure in our communities and community land trusts, Google it, do whatever you can do to it and see if that looks like something that is suitable for the land you might have or governments, governments have land. They give it away every day. We don't get it. Let's go after governments and get the land and uh, change what's happening. Anyway, I'll leave that. That's my, my thing. Okay. But the other and thing- and Thank you for helping us transition over to the question part of the program. I'm not gonna get my full pay for this one because I'm off schedule, uh, but we're gonna go over to, uh, we've got a few questions um, in the Q and A, and I know there are some things in the chat um, as well that we'll, we'll have, and we do need to kind of to try to keep to uh, to uh, time because we'll just you know whether we'll cut off. So anyway, I'm going to say the question, um, and I'm just going to uh, in terms of getting a few notes, see if folks just direct them in terms of who could answer. So there's a question here that says. Uh, Senator Dan Christmas often refers to the incredible changes in culture, language, sense of belonging, and graduation rates in Indigenous communities where self-determination in education is present. Wonder, wondering if similar research has been done in African Nova Scotian communities, 
and how both communities can work together to push for self-determination, education, and community. So Barb, I'm going to go over to you for that one. I, um, and I'm going to go up. There's another question, Robert, which I'm going to ask you to think about. And this one is, how do we mobilize and leverage the community to become more politically engaged? So Barb, if you could uh, take the first question for us. Thanks, Sylvia. Can you just give the summary again of the, because it yeah. was a lot in the question. One, yeah, so wondering if similar research, so really educating our, for ourselves, doing for ourselves, um, has been done in the African Nova Scotian community um, and how both communities, Indigenous uh, and ourselves can work together. And I know you, I know you have okay. some explicit research going yeah, on. Yeah, sure. So, so I, I think in terms of, it depends on the level of education. And so I know that in, in the Indigenous community, they have sort of developed their own school, which is fantastic and is working as being successful um, with P to 12, I believe is, is the eight, is the grade level. We don't have that same structure in Nova Scotia for our for black learners. And we do still recognize within the public school system, there are educational opportunities that our students don't have access to or resources to. And so we, we know, and so I have done some research and, and new research is being done. And I love the fact that even um, on a call last night, we learned that they're still doing more research around the individual program plan that is still um, impacting our African Nova Scotian learners and our Indigenous learners um, proportionally higher than other racialized groups. And at the university level, we still aren't seeing um, as many students graduating from high school and going into post-secondary. Um, that's why we have a number of initiatives at Dalhousie, at, uh, and at other universities, at the community colleges to try to increase that. And so, for instance, we are looking at gaps across the field. Um, my focus is in the faculty of health. And when I think about the faculty of health, we still have not graduated more than 10 African Nova Scotian students or five African Nova Scotian students in a number of our programs. And so as a, as a community, when I think about what are some of the things we can continue to do, I think in order to, to change that, and an Imhotep legacy is one of those examples where we were working in partnership with the Indigenous community, um, recognizing that some of our, our some of our challenges are very similar, although yet different. So there has been initiatives in place where you have the Indigenous community and the African Nova Scotian community working side by side to improve the opportunities for both our Indigenous community and our, our Black community. Um, and Imhotep legacy would be one of those examples that we are doing um, to actually do that. So we, we're not, there is a, an improvement, but we're not where we should be when you think about the number of resources that are in place to support our African Nova Scotian learners. Thanks, Barb. Um, Robert, how yeah. do we mobilize? How do we mobilize? Well, I think that uh, uh, the good news is that we've been seeing African Nova Scotians more actively engaged in politics than we have in the past. Um, uh, at the provincial level, and of course at the federal level, we have a partisan system, and so we know that there are parties, and to run, uh, if you're not going to run as an independent, you have to be connected to a party. Uh, but I think that um, one of the things that we can do as a Black community is we can have our own African Nova Scotian community political education uh, uh, work. Uh, just, uh, you know, it can be civics 101. What does it mean to be at the municipal government level? What is the responsibility of the provincial government? What is the responsibility of the federal government? How does a cabinet work? Uh, what does an MLA do? What, how do you, how does legislation get passed? If we could educate our people that way, and even how do political parties work? How do you get nominated? What is it like to run an election? All of that education can happen within our communities, separate and apart from the partisan system. And then our people are much more able to engage politically and to run for office. But I think that uh, one of the things that uh, that I'm seeing as a trend is that political parties these days seem to have acknowledged the need to change the palette of their uh, roster of, of people who are, who are running. You know, It's not cool to run an all white slate of candidates. And so what happens, it seems like, 
is that the party approaches a black person on a Monday, puts their name on a ballot on Tuesday, and then the election is a Thursday. And then if the black person wins, great, they're in the legislature. If they're not, so long, Charlie. Like, like where is the engagement with political parties in the black community in between elections? Uh, are the parties coming to us? And I think that that's putting the responsibility on the parties. But I'd say, what are we doing to educate ourselves and our people about political processes? Because it's one thing to have a demonstration and say, stop street checks. It's another thing to be engaged in the development of policy and legislation that would change the very nature of policing. Um, so we need to educate ourselves. And I have been in conversations, I've had idle conversations with people, some of whom I'm, are even in this uh, forum this evening, about how we would go about establishing uh, community-based education around politics so that we can empower our people to be more engaged in that process. Very much, Robert. I hope I wasn't distracting when I've been trying to read the chat and trying to move my hand around. <laughs> I realized that's happened. I probably should go off camera. But we are near close um, in terms of this evening's event. I know that it's flown by. I'm going to give you one more rapid round of uh, two word answer or something to this question, Robert. You did a little bit of it, but uh, for, for uh, each panel, um, it says, how can we in government, so I'm sorry, somebody in government, authentically include African Nova Scotian communities in our committees and tables and stop tokenism? So I want you to give me two words, max a sentence to answer that, each one. And Barb, you got the pressure to do it in that time frame first. You are so funny, so yeah. So one of the things that I would say, my two words to stop asking the people of African descent, our black community, African Nova Scotians, to do the heavy lifting for free. Um, we have expertise around the tables. We deserve to be paid for those expertise when being asked to sit on committees to inform and educate um, the government. And, and, and last, one of your questions, and I know I only have two minutes, but I want to, to indicate and call out the Afrocentric cohort out of Auburn that is um, increasing our number of students of African descent going on to post-secondary. They had a, a class of 50, of 20, and almost every last one of them went on to post-secondary education. So it is possible when we have immersion programs that support our African Nova Scotian students. So sorry, I want to add that tip. <laughs> Carolyn, you're, Carolyn, you're in competition. See how you show up. Come on. <laughs> We, do I see Carolina? She's still here. And you may have to I repeat think the question. I think she's having an audio problem. Yeah. Let's go to someone else. Okay, then. Liam, going over to you then. Sorry, on the mute. Um, I have two things. I want community organizers and I want multi-year funding. And what that is, is that we're leaving behind all the people that don't have PhDs and BAs and MEDs and and but are doing really good grassroots organizing. I call them community organizers. They need to be funded as long as uh, we need them and we need to name them and we need to pay them. Um, and we'll get the work done. The other thing is that I'm tired of, of government coming into our communities, offering the term for a month and maybe a year if you're lucky and no long-term strategy or funding to really affect uh, the change that we need within our communities. Thank you. Robert? I would say this, that one of the things we need to recognize is that recruiting black people into government jobs um, so that we have representation or people in, the, in government uh, to, um, to help government work more effectively in the black community is probably one of the most important things that we can do to hire people into government and put them on trajectories so that their careers will be developed and they'll be able to take on leadership. Uh, and then and there will be a critical mass of black folk working on the inside of government to support uh, this work. But in order for that to be done, government must acknowledge that 
the civil service is a hostile environment for black people. And you cannot hire black people into a toxic environment and then task them with trying to address the systemic racism that exists in the community when they're battling the systemic racism every single day at their desks. So I think that that's something that needs to, we need to see. And then the other thing is we need to, governments need to more effectively engage in community engagement. Government really doesn't do uh, community engagement because anyone inside of the government would tell you that what government has is a budget planning cycle. Uh, and it's, it's a very quick annual cycle that actually has very little time for planning. So there's a lot of budgeting, but not a lot of planning. And so if you want to grow an initiative that can then become part of the government inf infrastructure, you have to have an awful lot of, of weight, political might, to shoehorn it in, boom, in this planning cycle and get, uh, because uh, anyone who's been involved in government would tell you, we were great at budgeting, very bad at planning. And that planning cycle, that the absence of a planning cycle really does not provide opportunity for real community engagement. That's why we in the community need to do that work. And then we need to learn how to shove our demands into that budget cycle in a way that is so persuasive that government will be overwhelmed by our, our, our request. Um, that would be my comment. Thank you, Robert. It sounds like a real agency action <laughs> that you've left us with as, as we transition to the close of this evening's program. There was comments about media um, and about uh, trauma. So those are maybe some questions folks want to share with the email link that was provided there for further questions, suggestions on panels, um, et cetera. Um, so in terms of that, really thrilled with the engagement in the chat, um, with the questions that people shared, and my, my most humble and heartfelt thank you to all the panelists um, who, as again, shared your time and expertise um, and really made this an engaging time for folks who were able to come and share. Thanks as well again to uh, Inspiring Communities and the Character Institute for, for, for being a collaborator partner um, in this event. And to let you know that this is being, it is being recorded and it will be available on the McCaffrey Institute YouTube page um, in very short time. So thank you again, everyone. Take care, be safe, um, and remember, your voice is one voice, but it matters.